So we have seen in an earlier video that if you plot force versus elongation, you get a linear plot that's based on geometry. There's geometry dependence. On the other hand, if you plot sigma versus epsilon, you get a single linear plot, right? So you have a different force versus delta L plot for different geometry, same material, but all of those reduce to a single linear plot when you plot sigma versus epsilon. Now what happens beyond this linear region, right? So there is life beyond what happens uh, with the elastic zone. Now what material scientists do is they use a machine called material testing machine. They will take their specimen because they want to find out what its properties are beyond elasticity limits and they will apply tensile load on it. And what they would do is they would have load sensors and they will have strain gauges to measure what forces are applied and what kind of strain develops as a result of applying those uh, forces and stresses and they will plot them and they will plot them until the point when the material actually breaks. Okay, so material testing machines will actually give you a much more interesting and larger plot than just a linear thing shown over here. You will see that linear thing, but there will be more than that. Too. So if you plot sigma versus epsilon for let's say structural steel, so structural steel, structural steel is a ductile material, which means that it will actually appreciably deform before it fractures. You will see something like this. So you'll have a linear portion which will correspond to same thing that is shown over here and then after that it will curve a little bit and then there will be a little bit of a dip and then after that it will rise before it will fracture so this is fracture so this is a general pattern for a ductile material now there are different regions different zones over here that you know you need to learn about so first of all, we have the elasticity limit, right? So up to this point, we'll call this point A. Okay, so up to this point A, the plot is more or less linear. So this is actually a straight line going from here to here, all right? So if you know what the stress is at this point, let's call it, I don't know what we'll call it, we'll call it sigma one, okay? And if you know what the strain is here, let's call it epsilon one, then you can find out what the Young's modulus is, right? So you have the Young's modulus defined as sigma one, over epsilon one because it's a straight line and you know knowing the sigma one knowing the epsilon one you will know what this value is after that the plot is no longer linear but you are still in the in the elastic zone so let's say this is the point b okay that's the point b now this point b over here is the limit of elasticity so which means that after point A, the plot is no longer linear, but it is still elastic. So you are still in the elastic zone, which means that if you take the force away, if you remove the application of the force, then the specimen is going to regain its original length. All right. Let's say if it was uh, under tension. But after point B, there will come a time when if you even if you remove the forces, the material is not going to regain its shape. And we say that's the onset of plastic deformation. So this is onset of plastic deformation. So plastic deformation by definition is a permanent deformation. So when we say plastic deformation, that basically means permanent deformation and elastic deformations are temporary. So let me write that elastic deformation are equivalent to temporary deformation, temporary, while plastic deformation is equivalent to permanent deformation. So beyond point B is the ons what we call onset of plastic deformation, okay? And this is when we say that yielding has begun to occur so it's called yielding so when the material begins to yield that means it's undergoing you know plastic deformation so it will continue to deform and then there's a little dip in the actual stress and then the stress will continue to rise and it will be what we call the maximum stress at some point and this is called ultimate this point let's call this uh, point uh, uh, we'll call it point d uh, because you know this is like a sort of a dip point so we'll, we'll, we'll give it a separate name C so the D is actually what we call the ultimate 
stress point. So the ultimate stress point. This is the largest stress that a ductile material like a structural steel or some grade of aluminum or some other grade of a metal like copper alloy or like brass or, or bronze uh, could experience. And after that, actually, the stress decreases very rapidly up to a point where it actually fractures. So you can see for the tile material, the, the fracture stress, the stress at the fracture is actually less than the ultimate stress, okay? So from here to here is what we call elastic zone. So elastic zone. And then beyond that, it's, this is all plastic deformation or we, what we call, you know, plastic zone, okay? Now this is the kind of plot that you get for uh, the tile, most of the tile materials. But then there are certain other detail materials where you get a similar plot, but not identical. So for example, uh, most of the grades of the aluminum alloy wouldn't have this kind of sharp peak. What they would have is like a linear zone. And then after that, you know, it would go up before it would fracture. Okay, so there is no dip over here to indicate, you know, when the yielding has actually started. So it's kind of hard to tell up to what point you have the elastic zone and then beyond which you have the plastic deformation. So in this case, we'll use a, a formula to actually compute, you know, what that concept. So in both of these plots, the points of interest are really the point A, which is uh, the, the limit of linear elasticity, and then point B, which is the onset of yielding. And we will define the stress at this point to be yield stress. So we'll call it actually sigma y. So sigma y is yield stress. And then we have looked at point D, which is the ultimate stress point, right? So that's your ultimate stress point. So these are some of the important points for us. So E, which is our elasticity modulus, elasticity modulus. And these are the three properties that we are mostly interested in when we are doing analysis of uh, how much stress a certain geometry or a certain part can take. Um, We'll be interested in knowing what these three properties are for other kinds of uh, uh, metal alloys as well, like aluminum alloy, of which this is the plot. Okay, now to, just to give you some ballpark number as to how elasticity modulus differ from material to material, for aluminum, elasticity modulus is close to 70 gigapascal. This is for aluminum, some grade of aluminum alloy, and there is usually a range, but for steel, the E is close to 210 gigapascal. So you can see that there is a factor of three over here. So what does it mean that elasticity modulus for a steel is three times the elasticity modulus of aluminum? What that means is that if you pick a specimen made of two different materials, same geometry, so same length L, same cross-sectional area, you apply the same force F. So let's say this one is made of steel and the other one is made of aluminum. Okay, same length L and cross-sectional area and the same tensile force F applied. Then we know that E is defined as sigma over A. Okay, sorry, sigma over epsilon, not sigma over A. So that's sigma over epsilon. Okay, sigma is going to be same for both the cases because sigma is F over A and epsilon is delta L over L. Okay, so this is E of aluminum and then we have E of steel equal to F over A divided by delta L over L, right? So numerator in both the cases is the same because cross-sectional area is the same, the same force is applied. So if I divide equation one with two, what do I get? I get E of aluminum divided by E of steel equal to, I'll have this delta L over L go in the numerator. So this will be delta L of steel divided by L divided by delta L of aluminum divided by L and L and L cancel. So we get delta L of steel divided by delta L of aluminum equal to E of aluminum divided by E of steel. Now, this factor over here is 70 over 210, right? So that's close to one over three. And that means that delta L steel will be one third of delta L of aluminum, right? So for the same geometry, same forces, the deformation or the elongation of a steel specimen will be one third of aluminum. So that sounds like a good thing to have, right? You don't want to have too much 
uh, deformation, which would lead to lead, which would lead to large strain. But at the same time, you know, you're going to pay a price because the steel is almost three times uh, more in density in density than aluminum is. So, which means your structure is going to be heavier. Now, design is usually a multi objective multi-constrained problem which means that you have to find the right balance you don't want to make something too heavy something too light uh, because if your job can be done by uh, some certain grade of aluminum then why do you want to pick the steel so the walker example that we discussed before uh, you know standard medical grade walker that sells for 20 30 dollars you don't want to necessarily make it too heavy for people when aluminum would do the job and that's the reason why most of those walkers are made of aluminum because they can take the load uh, for the, their particular geometry. So we've talked about uh, uh, st steel, uh, their stress strain plot, we've talked about aluminum and both of them are more or less ductile material. So this is for some grade of aluminum alloy. Okay, so there's no sharp peak over here like you have for, for the uh, steel, but you know, we can estimate that to some extent. What happens if you plot the sigma versus epsilon uh, curve or graph for a brittle material like chalk or ceramic or even acrylic, the kind of material that you will deal with when you have your robot kit? Uh, well, if you plot that, essentially what you get is something like this. So essentially there is no plastic deformation because brittle material will not plastically deform to any extent and it might have some elasticity, so it will uh, deform to a certain extent if you let the force go it will try to regain the shape but beyond a certain point it is going to fracture there will be no plastic deformation so this is this is the fracture point and this is for a brittle material like chalk okay all right so let's uh, look at our structural steel uh, sigma versus epsilon uh, plot and see if we can compute some of the numbers okay so i'm going to just make up some numbers over here so let's say we have some grade of steel and this is what the plot looks like. Okay, this is the fracture point. And I want to know what my E in this case is. Okay, so I need to put in some numbers. So let's say over here, this is my point A, that's the limit of uh, linear zone. So this is, I don't know, let's say 50 kilo psi. So that's 50 kilo pound per square inch. And then the strain over here, this is the epsilon, this is sigma, epsilon over here is let's say 2%, okay? So in this case, E would be equal to 15 to 10 power three divided by 2% is 0 0.02. So that would give us what? 15 to 10 power uh, five, uh, because it's two, 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 two and 10 power minus two. So divided by two over here, so that's 25, or I should say 2.5 to 10 power six mega, uh, PSI, right? Make up here the pound per square inch. So that's what the elasticity modulus would be in this case. Now, what about uh, yield stress? So yield stress is here. This is point B. We're looking for sigma Y. So, you know, it has to be definitely more than 50 kilo psi. Let's say this is 60, you know, kilo psi. So that you can directly read from the chart if you're given. So sigma, sigma Y is 60 kilo psi in this case. If you're also looking for ultimate tensile strength, then you have, you can read that. This is point D which is sigma u, okay, so sigma u is the ultimate tensile strength and it would definitely be more than 60, so let's say this is 80 kilo psi, so that's 80 you know, kilo psi, right? So that's for uh, some grade of steel where you have a definite uh, onset of plastic deformation. Now, what about those metal alloys where you don't have this sharp peak, okay? which indicates the onset of yielding. So let's see what happens in that case. So we will basically have something like this, or like more or less a linear zone, and then you have a curved portion, right? So in this case, again, to find the, the E or the elasticity modulus, we will estimate as to where the limit of the linear plot is. So we'll read what the sigma over here is. And let's say, I don't know, this is 20 kilo psi, okay, some grade of aluminum. And then A, at point A, the epsilon, the strain is 0.15 uh, uh, or, you know, or maybe, maybe we'll call it 0.15%. Then E would be equal to 20 into 10 power 3. That's a pound per square inch divided by 0.15 into 10 power minus 2. And this would be equal to what? So this would be uh, 20 over 15 into 10 power 
this will be 10 power 4 is so 10 power 7 this may be a too large number this would not happen in reality for an aluminum alloy so this will be what 4 3 so that's 1.33 into 10 power 7 um, psi right so i will write this as what 13.3 into 10 power 6 psi or that would be 13.3 mega psi right so that would be the e in this case okay so that's that part is similar to what we did over here in this example now what about sigma u right well, sigma y actually the yield strength what is sigma y in this case how do we find that so for this case there is something called two percent offset rule 0.2% offset rule. So what we would do is we will locate where our 0.2% strain is and we will draw a line that will be parallel to this line over here. So for the linear uh, part of the stress versus strain plot, we will actually draw and this is kind of exaggerated over here because 0.2% will never be that far from 0.15% but we'll draw a line that will be parallel to this line over here. So this, uh, this line is L, L1 and this line L2 and the L1 and L2 are actually Parallel. and we will intersect it with the plot and we will read what the stress is at this point and that would be our sigma yield point right so this is called 0.2 percent offset rule and this is the rule that is used to find what the yield strength might be and remember these these are experimental form formulas right so this is not like there there's a physical law behind it these are experimentally observed to be okay so at 0.2 percent offset if you measure what the yield strength would be by drawing this line over here that's parallel to the line that you have for the elastic linear elastic zone of the material then you get very close to the actual uh, yield point 